Sure. Mara Modesta Mara, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from the University of Burgos in Spain. You are a paleoanthropologist combining data analysis with dental anthropology of the Ataperca hominins with a special interest in the species Homo antecessor, the pioneering hominids who were likely the first to colonize Western Europe. So how are you doing, Mario? You um you spend a lot of time at the at a puerca site. I'm sure it's good to be back there after the pandemic kept you desk bound. Yeah, correct. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. So for me, it's like an honor to discuss this interest that I'm having uh, since I was very little. And so thank you for the invitation, Mark. We'll be finding out all about this fascinating species, including its place in our family tree. But before we dig deep into the world of Homo antecessor, let's just hear a bit about your background. Mario, did you always have an interest in science and in particular, the fossils of the Atapuerca Mountains? Uh, the first time I heard about Atapuerca, the name Atapuerca, was back in 1997 when the species Homo antecessor was published in science for the first time. So I had at the time 11 years old. So you, you may imagine that my uh, interest in anthropology and more, in, more importantly in dental anthropology has been along in my, in my life. So, uh, but it's curious because nobody around me when I was younger uh, was related with science, with anthropology. So I don't know how I developed this incredible uh, interest in anthropology, in evolution, but always with um, with the biological background, because I, th I think that basically if we understand how we are right now, so we mm -hmm. can assess how were the hominins in the past. Basically, when when I decided very, very when I was very young to study biology, and I studied finally biological sciences at uh, University uh, Complutense University in Madrid. I finished my career there, my degree. Later, I moved to Tarragona, also in Spain, uh, to study a master in archaeology, quaternary archaeology and human evolution. So I spent two years there, and my final work of the master was about dental development in the Atapuerca hominins, we can discuss later, obviously, some of the species that were discovered in this incredible mountain. And uh, finally, I moved to Burgos. I had the chance to, to have a, a pre-doc contract in Spain. And I did my PhD about dental development of all the Atapuerca hominins, but also including a large amount of Homo sapiens uh, material in order to uh, establish a framework to compare with. And finally, I finished my PhD in 2019. And afterwards, I was working as a guide of the Tapuerca site. And everybody knows the pandemic came with the COVID. Mm. So I spent a couple of years studying a new master about big data and artificial intelligence, because I am also very, very interested in a data analysis and artificial intelligence in order to answer biological questions. And now it's what I'm right now doing in my current job. Mario, it's probably true to say that not many people have heard of antecessor. They aren't as well known as, say, Neanderthals or Homo erectus. So let's just start with an overview of the species. When did Homo antecessor live and what do we know about them? That's a very question, Mark. Homo antecessor was discovered for the first time in 1994 in one of the archaeological sites of the Atapuerca mountain, which is called Grandolina. That, uh, the 8th of July in that year, 1994, uh, in a small area, uh, some of different fossils appeared, and some of them were human teeth, parts of the long bones, etc. At the time, there was like a um, theory, a hypothesis, that the oldest European was not beyond 500,000 years old. But at that time, we knew that these fossils 
of the later known Homo antecessor were uh, older than 500,000 years. So in uh, later research uh, with uh, geochronology, we now know perfectly that these fossils are about 860,000 years old, right? So mm. more interestingly is that we decided to name this as Homo antecessor because antecessor comes from Latin and it means the pioneer, so the first explorer. So the, in other words, the first out of Africa hominin. Now we know that this is not really true because we are having the Dimanisi fossils in Georgia. But at the time we decided to include this uh, as a new species. Nowadays, uh, there are about 200 different fossils of this species. All of the parts of the body are represented and they belong at least today to 11, 11 different individuals. And more interestingly is that most of them belong to children, or yeah. in other words, they are not adult. So around 70 to 80 percent of these individuals, they are beyond, they are between the three years and also uh, 15 years, right? So they are pretty young, and that is surprising. At some point, if we try to um, to know which is the origin, so that's a mystery so far, because. Uh, there is no other place in the world which uh, Homo antecessor has been recovered and described as it is. It is true that some years ago now, uh, there is an Italian an Italian site which is called Ciprano, that uh, when this fossil was discovered, it is an adult skull, and they thought, the scientists thought that this uh, skull belonged to a Homo antecessor adult. However, uh, nowadays, recent uh, geochronological analysis or dating of this fossil, they consider that it is much younger, around uh, 200 to 300,000 years old. So it goes beyond the, the time when Homo antecessor was living in, the, in Atapuerca, in Burgos. Mario, what is so special about antecessor that compelled paleoanthropologists to deem it a new species rather than say Homo erectus, which we know was a big presence in uh, Western Europe at the time. Yeah, so that's a very intriguing question, but it has its data which support the description of a new species in our uh, human lineage evolution. So in summary, uh, Homo antecessor displays a combination of derived and primitive features, not only in the face, but also in different parts of the skeleton that we have now discovered. So the combination of, of, the, or of this mosaic of, of features, if we focus now on the face, which is one of the key parts in here, mm -hmm. is that it is the unique species in the world, in all of our history, if we are not uh, included in this a bunch of species, Homo sapiens. This is the unique one which has a flat face, a orthognatic face. So, if you if you imagine now Australopithecus or uh, Neanderthals or Homo heidelbergensis or any other species in our in, a, in our human lineage, so they are all having like nostrils. So I'm having here one skull which maybe may sound familiar f uh, for most of you. This is a, a cast, obviously, of the school number five, also discovered in Atapuerca in another archaeological site. So this is the school number five discovered in Cima de los Huesos, yeah. around uh, 400,000 years old. So if I turn it to my left in here, so you can see that the face is projected onwards, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, frontwards, right? However, if I take another is a cast of Homo antecessor. So maybe yes. I can put in here where you can see it properly. So this is part of the maxilla in here. This is the, the nose. There are some oh, teeth yes. in here below, right? I can pull also in here. So maybe you can see it right now. Yep. So if I turn this again uh, to the left, so you, so you can see that the face is vertical, is sort of naked, orthognatic. So this is one of the key features that 
helped the scientists to describe a new species because this is the only one in the world without Homo sapiens inside, which is having our face, a vertical face, the unique mm. one. But more importantly is that not only this is uh, the right future, but if we were looking this skull, because we also discovered part of the, the front and the eyebrows of this specimen, the eyebrows, if I'm taking again the, the school number five of Sima de los Huesos, so you can see that the front is not vertical like ours, so it's going backwards, right? So the skull of human antecessor has also the same structure, so the primitive uh, backward projection of the front. So the combination of a vertical face and a front bone going backwards, it is a unique mix uh, of futures which uh, ultimately allowed the scientists to describe this species, Homo antecessor. But as, as I told you, not only these are the unique features which justified the creation of, the news, uh, the, of this new uh, hominin, but also some data on the, on the humerus in here or some data on the morphology of the teeth. So there is a combination of features which are only, which were only found in this species. And that's why Homo antecessor is now very well um, understood and um, agreed in the scientific community as a different species in a human lineage. Right. And how would you know, Mario, that uh, this entire species had this flat face? Is there any way that you could, uh, you could tell yeah. that? Sure. Actually, if we are all uh, putting our fingers in here and we press and move our fingers upwards so you mm -hmm. will see so we all of us will notify that we're having here this bone which is the malar bone in here and yeah. the place where we are putting our fingers is the the canine fossa it's like a fossa uh, above the the upper canines so in this specimen in here it is not well mm -hmm. seen so let me find it in here maybe in here we let me find mm -hmm. oh, maybe in here, in this part. Yeah. Let me. So this is precisely the same yeah. fossa, and this is only found in this specimen in here. Another point, because obviously this is science, and we need to be critic with all of our colleagues in order to promote science, right? In order to improve the the hypothesis and the theories that we are using. So when we publish this uh, this species. A uh, long time ago now, right? 25 years old I, ago, sorry. We thought that this species was the common ancestor of Homo sapiens on the one hand and Neanderthals on the other. This, this has also created a, a long debate, which is still partially unresolved. But uh, as I told you some minutes ago, so most of the individuals were young, mm. right? Or children. So. In other words, so we described a new species by using uh, futures, morphological futures of uh, non-adult individuals. And that created a long discussion, a long debate uh, in the scientific community. However, uh, in order to know if this face in here, let me put in this part, if this face in here, uh, when this individual became adult, was going to be also flat or front uh, or projected frontwards like any other. So we also know the answer in here. So we know that the face of this specimen, if an adult, would be also vertical, orthognatic. And the question is, how do you know how the face would be in the future for this individual? So we know. So we studied the surface of the bone itself in these areas of the canine fossa, also in here, above the, the roots, in here below the, the nose. And it is important to know a couple of cells in here. So there are two cells that create an, and destroy bone, right? So the cells that create bone are named as osteoblasts, whereas the cells that destroy bone 
is named are named uh, osteoclast. The osteoclast and osteoblast, whenever they destroy or create uh, bone, so they create a different topography on the surface of the of the bone itself. So when we analyze the surface bone of this specimen, this Homo antecessor fossil, so we we discovered that the surface was related with the osteoclasts, so destroy bones. So we would never expect this specimen to have a vertical face because at the time when this uh, when this individual passed away, uh, basically they were destroying bones. So at any point we will expect to have a projected uh, face like anybody species in the human lineage. So this is a very interesting uh, discover, which, uh, which obviously um, convinced the critics at the beginning of this, the creation of this species. So is there any way we can tell from the fossil evidence what the behavior of this species was? This species in particular in uh, Grandolina is particularly intriguing because we discovered that in all the fossils or most of the fossils, no matter where they are uh, or they belong to, they were having cut marks on the surface. So the first uh, analysis, the first um, uh, thought about how cut marks were there is because they were cannibalized. And it is true that they were cannibalized, all of them, right? So this is the first shocking uh, discover on this behavior of these specimens. However, we are asking, we asked in the past, uh, which are going to be the possibilities of this cannibalism? Why were they cannibals? So there were a couple of opposite hypotheses. One is the because it is a gastronomic uh, cannibalism. So in other words, there were not any other animals around, so they killed the others or killed or they were dead and they feed uh, their bodies. So they use them as food, basically. Hmm. So we know, we now know that this is not true. Uh, based on the discovery of some, uh, some colleagues in Tarragona, so uh, we know that if this was the case, gastronomic uh, uh, cannibalism, we will expect not to find any other animal in the same layer in the same strata of this specimen in Grandolina. However, not only in this layer the homotheses were discovered, but a lot of different fossils from different animals, deers, horses, bisons, and they were also having uh, cut marks. So they were having food around. So the gastronomic uh, cannibalism is now rejected based on this data. So which is the other? Uh, possibility. So the opposite uh, hypothesis is the terrestrial cannibalism. It is known that chimpanzees, they are frugivorous, so they eat fruit basically all year in the tropical forests, but sometimes they are cannibals. They are cannibals. Mm. When are they cannibals? When they are fighting between groups for resources basically. So when one group wants to go to another, so they invade the territory and there is a war. And this is properly described by Jane Goodall, for instance. Um, and in those wars, they are cannibals. So the group which win, they tend to eat and manage uh, and the ones that are dead or are of the opposite group in here. And this scientist from Tarragona so they compared the animals that they killed, the animals that they feed, and they discovered that most of the individuals that were killed and eaten by chimpanzees, the winners, they were mostly children. And mm. the way they were combining, the way they, the, the way they were uh, taking out the, the, the skin from the bone, how they were separating the tendons from the from the muscles and the bones, etc. They all match what we observe in the Homo antecessor fossils in Grandolina. So, and this is 
also very, very interesting because it is related with the location of the Grand Ol uh, of the location of the Sierra de Atapuerca, so the Atapuerca Hill in Burgos. And we can also talk about this a uh, few minutes, if you wish. In summary, Homo antecessor were cannibals. There are 11 individuals that are cannibalized in there. They follow the pattern that we know happens in chimpanzees. And this is linked with the ecological situation of the uh, Grandolina site compared to the Atapuerca Hill. Okay, we can't really discuss the species without mentioning the Atapuerca Mountains in northern Spain. Not only did it give up precious fossils of antecessor, but also Neanderthals and several others. So can you talk about the importance of this site and what exactly has been found there? Perfect, because that's one of the questions like the most, because for me, Atapuerca is like my passion, to be mm -hmm. honest. So, and in order to link this with the Homo antecessor, uh, basically, if we find out the map or we imagine the map of Spain, it's a Puerca hill. It's a very little hill, northern Spain, and it is placed in, in the middle of a natural corridor which connects to different basins of rivers in Spain. So you can imagine that this Atapuerca hill is placed in a very rich and demanded ecological area and this is why we suppose we expect uh, that the Atapuerca hill the Grandolina site was particularly important relevant for the groups to fight to conquer this area in particular so if we go beyond the Grandolina and we zoom out a little bit so we Atapuerca hill uh, it's composed of more than 180 different archaeological sites. More important is that all of them were formed in different periods. And when we combine all of them as if they were one single in vast, huge archaeological and paleontological site, so we have the full human history in Europe from 1.4 million years old until today, with no exception. All species that were found in Europe, all of them are were found in Atapuerca in different archaeological sites. For instance, this year, in 2022, in the site I've been digging for 20 years now, which is called Cima del Elefante, or Elephant Spit in English, uh, we found in the layer TE7 the remains of the maxilla and part of the eye of the oldest hominin in Western Europe. We still don't know which is the chronology, but we know it is older than 1.2 million years old. In 2007, in an upper layer, in this same site, Cima del Elefante, we discovered a, a part of the symphysis of a mandible, of all, obviously of another hominin, uh, which was published also in Nature, um, and it is it was at that time the oldest remain of hominins in Europe. So, Cima del Elefante is, contains today the oldest remains in Western Europe. Another site which is very important is Grandolina, so we just talk about it. The other one is Cima de los Huesos, or Pit of the Bones, uh, where it is about 430,000 uh, years old, and we have the biggest collection of human fossils of the middle Pleistocene in the world. So we found more than 7,000 different fossil remains which belong to the same population, which are pre-Neanderthals. At the time, at the beginning, we named this population as Homo heidelbergensis, but now we prefer this terminology of pre-Neanderthals. In any case, this is one of the, it's, you are now familiar with uh, this sculling here. So around 29 different individuals, all the bones of the body recovered, even the smaller one, the smallest one in the, in the, in the body, which are the ear bones. So incredible. We are having also Neanderthals 
in, in one site, which is called Galeria de las Estatuas. Uh, we are also having a lot of different he modern humans, so homo sapiens, uh, from the Bronze Age, Neolithic Age, Medieval Age, Roman um, Roman remains. So we have in a v relatively very sh little space, geographically talking, all the history of the human species in Europe. And that's why uh, 22, uh, 22 years ago, in 2000, uh, UNESCO declared Ataporquia Hill as World Heritage. Right. And are they all different ages, Mario, all these different uh, species? Yeah, for sure. So the first, uh, the first Europeans in Cima del Elefante, they, they range between 1.2 to 1.4 million years, All the 1.4 needs to be confirmed with the new studies that are now being, uh, that are now ongoing. Um, Homo antecessor is 860,000 years old, uh, pre Neanderthals 430,000 years old, the Neanderthals is around 100, uh, one, uh, 1,000, 50,000 years old, uh, Homo sapiens, uh, Bronze Age, me, uh, Leothi, uh, Neolithic Age. So, but it is true that I am now focusing on the, um, the fossil themselves of hominids, mm -hmm. but important is that we have the remains or the the evidences of their presence in all the, the other layers in the Taporca. So in between 1.2 to 860,000 years old, so we have layers with stone tools and also uh, animals that were managed and were butchered by this uh, the in between hominins. We are also having evidences of 600,000 years old. We are, we are also having uh, evidences of stone tools. Uh, 200,000 years old, we are also having evidence of stone tools and cut marks. And so the humans, have, uh, the humans from 1.4 million years until today, we have always been in the Atapuerca Hill. Right. So, and um, I'm assuming that the tools uh, associated with antecessor were more the the more primitive older one style. Is that right? Precisely. That's where I I, have, I was focusing my 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 interview basically in the in the fossil themselves of these species, but the stone tools of this Homo antecessor they are the old or the first mode the older one, uh, a African one. So the the very first technology um, uh, industry. So later in time, in Cima de los Huesos and other sites like Galeria or the younger levels in Grandolina, they, we find the Achillean uh, industry with the hand access and these very typical uh, industries uh, in the middle Pleistocene in Europe. But importantly is that if we see when the Achillean emerged in Africa, we know it was about 1.5 million years old. So in that time, in, uh, in Europe basically, or even later in time in the, in the Homo antecessor time, whereas in Africa, they were having an evolved technology in Achillean with very uh, detailed and very high profile uh, hand access, in Spain, in Burgos, we were still using the very old technology. So there were obviously a very huge time overlap of both technologies, either in Europe with the oldest one and in Africa with the younger at that time. Well, we've mentioned that most of the fossils found of this species have been of children. The most famous of these was named the boy of Grandolina, but the research you participated in found that this designation uh, may have been a bit premature. That's completely true. So I am the dental anthropologist, and in that particular study where I participated, we were studying in this specific hominin in here. So we, part, uh, we studied the canines in here. So basically this, let yeah. me find it, this tooth in here, which is in this part, this one, and the one which is not present in this cast. So if we compare, for instance, the canines 
of chimpanzees or gorillas. So we see that the canines of the males and the canines of the females, they are morphologically and in size completely different. So obviously the males are having larger canines than females, right? So we say that they are dimorphic. We find, we find that there are two different morphologies depending of males or females. And also if we dig inside the teeth, so by using a uh, microcomputer tomography, so we can evaluate as well the, com the proportion of enamel and dentin in these teeth. So by using a huge amount of uh, living uh, primates today and also uh, extant uh, or extinct hominins in, in our lineage, so we find out that the proportion of enamel and dentin in the canines of this specimen, Homo antecessor one, they overlap with what it is expected to be a female rather than a male. So from uh, two to three years now until now, so we name this as the girl of the Grandolina side, not the boy. So this is also very, very interesting, and we are very proud of this discovery. Well, right here in England, about 300 miles from me, is Haysborough Beach in Norfolk. Now, back in 2013, a pretty amazing find was made that really helped shine a light on Homo antecessors' uh, world. Isn't that right? Yes, yeah, so those footprints are particularly uh, challenging. And important is that they are tentatively assigned to be Homo antecessor. But if we go back to Homo antecessor, the around 200 different fossils that appear, they are all fragmentary, or most of them are fragmentary. And we still haven't uh, reconstructed a full foot of this specimen. Therefore, we don't know which is the, the real stature, the height, or the weight of these individuals. And we cannot match for sure that a uh, Homo antecessor was present and was the responsible of stepping in that beach uh, in, in England. So although the, the chronology matches, right, uh, we still are far to make a direct correlation between Homo antecessor on the one hand, which were the responsible of stepping in that particular uh, beach. So in this case, I'm almost sure that in the next years, we can give some light on this uh, on this matter because the Grandolina level where these uh, human successor uh, fossils were discovered, we only excavated around 20 meters squares, all distance, uh, distantly placed, so they are not connected, not all of them, these meters squares. And the overall size of this layer, each more than 200 meters squares. So this means that there is there are still 180 meters squares that contains now Homo antecessor fossils that needs to be discovered in the next year. So I'm sure that when we are getting to these squares, we will find out, we will find remains of all parts of the body and we can, we would be able to reconstruct full limbs of these specimens and we could make assumptions on how they were physically, anatomically, and we can make some correlations with the, with the depth of the steps in this, uh, of these foot, uh, footprints in order to see if the stature and also the weight of these individuals, they could be the ones in that uh, in England. And I believe um, people just came across these these uh, footprints. One day the tide had gone out, 
And uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, the tide has now covered them again. But it appeared to be a family with children running around on the beach, a, you know, 800,000 years ago. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. But this is really not surprising because if we go uh, to Africa, there are these late holy footprints, much older. They belong to Australopithecus uh, uh, afarensis. Uh, it is, I think it was around 3.4 million years old. And they were also representing a, nu a nucleus, a family with uh, adults and children. So this is our behavior over time. So we can see this behavior in uh, Australopithecus. We can also see this behavior in this still unknown uh, species in uh, in England, and obviously this is what we are right now. So we form a nucleus of family, and we can see this behavior in the last uh, 3.4 uh, million years old. Right. So I, I guess the the reason that it's thought they could be antecessor because it's the time frame is right. They they um, they date out to eight about eight hundred thousand years. That's correct, but it is a working hypothesis. So we mm. tend, we tentatively link both Homo antecessor and these footprints, but we still need to know how works uh, the anatomy of Homo antecessor in order to see if this matches with the footprints in England. Well, we know that the species probably evolved from Homo erectus, but did any hominid species evolve from antecessor? So the, the phylogeny of Homo antecessor is problematic because we find this species only in one single place. We don't have this species in any, other, in any other part of the world, not even in Africa, obviously. So we know that it must come from a species which might be part of Homo erectus or even from the Homo georgicus or some early Homo which uh, went um, out of Africa, 1.8 million years old, like there were fossils discovered in the Manisi in Georgia. So we suppose that Homo antecessor somehow, and also the ones coming from Cima del Elefante, 1.2 million years old, they can uh, be the descendant of the this species or this population from um, Georgia, from the Manisi. Mm -hmm. However, uh, in 1997, when Homo antecessor was published, the hypothesis was that this was the common ancestor of Neanderthals on the one hand and Homo sapiens on the other. If this were true, basically we would expect to find out, to find Homo antecessor in Africa because we know that Homo sapiens, the origin of Homo sapiens is Africa. Today, we don't have any fossil ascribed to this Homo antecessor. Uh, population. So therefore, we consider now that Homo antecessor might be like a dead end in the western western part of Europe. However, uh, maybe we need to focus our attention in the Near East because it is true that Homo antecessor has features that are later uh, discovered in Neanderthals. So obviously Neanderthals in other words, they must have some kind of genome link with Homo antecessor, but maybe not the Homo antecessor itself, which is found in the western part of Europe, in Spain, but maybe there was like a nucleus of population in the Near East, which we know now, uh, we, uh, theoretically, we name this as the CADE, so the Central Area for Dispersals in Eurasia, so this is the acronym. So this area might might have been a very relevant uh, area where uh, was the source of populations going to the east, creating Homo erectus in Asia, and to the west, creating later Homo antecessor uh, as well. So this area of the Near East might we I think we need to focus our attention in this particular part in order to see if uh, this might be the area where Neanderthals emerged and uh, inherited some of the dental traits that were present in Homo antecessor, although we know that Homo antecessor now might be a dead end. So this is, a, as you can see, 
this is not a final conclusion. There are a lot of questions, uh, of questions that still needs to be answered when more fossil human tests appear. But these are nowadays the the overview, the frame we are now using to understand the presence of this unique species in Spain. Well, that's definitely what we need, Mario, is we need more Homo antecessor fossils, especially a complete one. The whole body would be amazing, wouldn't it? I will expect to find that in the next five to ten years. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it really is fascinating work that you do, Mario, and I want to thank you for taking the time to come on to the show today. So what about new or future projects? Uh, what are you working on that uh, you can tell us about? First of all, the, the the conclusion of my PhD, based on the dental growth uh, of the enamel in the in these different uh, species in Atapuerca. So my final conclusion or hypothesis was that these hominids they were adult uh, as mature uh, at an age of 14 to 15 years old. So they reached adulthood at that age not like ourselves that we tend to with a huge variety and but the average is about 18 to 20 years old right so one of my lines that i am not continuing uh, in my current research is to trying to uh, find out new evidences to support this hypothesis from the roots of the teeth themselves but now to be um, to be precise now I came back to CENIE, which is the National Research Center in Human Evolution in Spain, which is placed in Burgos. I am, I, I am now enjoying a postdoctoral research uh, position under an ERC, which were um, uh, obtained by a scientist which is called uh, Leslie Lusco, and the name of the project is called Tight Two Teeth. And my role in that research is to uh, figure out the correlations between genes, the genomic and the genetics, uh, and also the morphology of the skull and the, the dentition themselves in different species like baboons and also uh, human species as well. So in that regard, uh, we are trying to uh, figure out the role of pleiotropy, which is uh, when a gene affects different futures in the phenotypic uh, part of the body. So it's related with genomes. And for me, it's something which motivates uh, incredibly. So I am very, very enthusiastic of this position and to uh, find out um, new solutions for these paleoanthropological questions. I will leave links to your social media and research papers in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Mario, for coming on to Evolution Soup. So thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed this interview. I love also doing science dissemination. And if some of the listeners to this interview discovered Homo antecessor, for me, it's like perfect. Mm -hmm.